Please turn back with me to Philippians chapter 1 and this passage beginning at verse 12. spoken quite a bit about them already this evening. There have been a number of things in recent weeks that have been happening in our church and in our wider circles that none of us would have asked for. Our sister Jane has been terminally ill and she went to be with the Lord on Friday. Our hearts ache for Simon and Susan and the family. We worry about Miriam and her health. On on the national side, we wonder, is there any future for Bible in schools? There are things that concern us. And we know, we tell ourselves, that God is going to use these things for good. But until we see that, We can't stop the question, why, from gnawing away in the back of our minds. The Christians in Philippi were asking, why? See, Paul had brought them the gospel. They prayed for him often, but he'd gone through a series of awful events that are recorded for us in Acts chapter 20 through to chapter 26. He was lied about. He was nearly lynched and flogged. He was denied a fair trial. He was misrepresented. He was almost assassinated. He was shipwrecked. And now he's in prison waiting for Caesar's judgment. The Philippian church is asking, why? Paul summarizes all of those trials and those challenges with five words. You'll see it there in verse 12. He says, what has happened to me? That's all he says about it. He's not asking for any sympathy. He doesn't want attention. He doesn't want the Philippians worrying about him. He wants them to marvel at Christ. Because for their view, from the outside of the situation, everything looks awful. And they can't help but ask, why? But from Paul's perspective on the inside, well, he can answer the why. And encourage the Philippians with what God is accomplishing through those circumstances. Let's pray. And we'll ask for God's help as we, as we look at this passage together. Father God, you reign in heaven. There is nothing in all the cosmos like you. You're so far beyond us. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts higher than our thoughts. And yet you condescend each Sunday to speak with us. Heavenly Father, we pray then that we would know your Holy Spirit dealing with us now as your word is opened as we see Paul encouraging and challenging the Philippian Christians, we pray that we too would be encouraged and challenged and convicted. That by your word we would be made more like our Saviour. Change us for his glory, we pray in his name. Amen. On Tuesday I went down to Balclutha to hear a minister from England speaking about theological preaching and he, we made the Britain connection and, and he asked me where, where was I living, what was I doing and I told him where Wyndham was and he looked at me with a kind of sympathetic look <laughs> and he said, well, you, you never know where you'll end up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there was almost a sense in which he, he thought I should be disappointed <laughs> at, being, at being here or I should be questioning God's wisdom in calling us to Wyndham. Like he was looking at me as if to say, oh, I don't envy you much at all. None of us would envy the Apostle Paul. He was the pastoral and intellectual 
powerhouse of the early church. He could speak in a way that was simple enough for gruff jailers and exploited girls to understand. And yet at the same time, he could debate on Mars Hill with the biggest thinkers of the day. Today, he would have an international ministry. He would lead a, a thriving, strong church that developed serious, committed Christians. God put him in prison with a congregation of bored soldiers. What good could come from this? Well, amazingly, as we see in this passage, God uses this situation to benefit five groups of people. And we're going to look at each of them in turn. The first group I want you to see that I helped is the church at Philippi, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, the Philippians had some different ideas about Paul. There would have been some of them who thought, he's pretty foolish, appealing to Caesar. Being in prison, well, that's not going to help anyone. All that's doing is bringing Christianity down, running the name of Christ through the mud. All of our neighbors know about the apostle in prison. How shameful. Then there would have been others who questioned whether God was really in control. Doesn't God look after and protect his servants? Don't think like that, says Paul. Instead, be encouraged because this situation is all of God. He's in perfect control and he's going to use it not to shame but to glorify Christ. He is using this circumstance to advance the gospel. So the Philippian church would be encouraged to see that God works the worst situations to his glory and his people's good. And we've thought about this before, haven't we? We saw this so clearly in the book of Habakkuk. But let's just frame this in a different way. I want you to see that this is not a theology of every cloud has a silver lining. Because that can be how it comes across. And it's a lie. You see, if you're not a Christian, there is a cloud of judgment on the horizon and there is nothing bright about it. There's not a flash or a shimmer to it. You are a sinner facing hell. And the worst difficulties that you are putting up with right now are only little showers compared to the storm that is coming. But being a Christian changes that entirely. You see, clouds still come into life, but they never come to do you harm, only ever good. They come to make us more like the Lord Jesus and to advance, as Paul says here, his kingdom, the gospel. You see, the Lord Jesus doesn't just bring a little bit of good out of the bad. It's not a silver edge to a bad situation, but he turns the whole situation to the good of his people and his glory. It's how William Cooper describes it in his great hymn. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds that you so much dread are big with mercy. Not disappointment, not failure, not eternal pain or anguish. They are big with mercy. That's what they look so black with. They're full of mercy and will break in blessings on your head. God turns the whole situation for our good and his glory. What an encouragement for Philippi. And what an encouragement for us. The second group of people that are affected are the palace guard. You see this in verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, Paul was a prisoner of Caesar. And so the palace guard are Caesar's personal bodyguard. This is the Praetorian guard. These are not your average squaddies. This is the ancient SAS that Paul is talking about. Tested veterans who were rough, tough, and ready for action. But now they've been taken from the battlefield. 
and given the job of guarding Caesar's palace and prisoners. They are trained killers with nothing to kill but time. And so you imagine what their life was like. You imagine what they spent their time doing. There were three topics of conversation in the mess. Sex, parties, and sports. That's what these men talked about. And then when it was time for them to do their work, they did it in shifts. Most of them would be stood to attention in a doorway. Some of them would be guarding prisoners. And for one man, it would be his five or six hour session to be chained to Paul. You can imagine how degrading it would be to be chained to a guard. That constant supervision. You would hate that chain, wouldn't you? You'd despise that thing that's taking away your freedom and privacy and dignity and comfort. But Paul saw that very differently. To him, it wasn't something to hate. It was a, a link, an unbreakable link to a person who needed the gospel. He says, I am in chains for Christ. And so Paul spoke to his guards. And they overheard as he dictated letters to churches and his letters from churches were read to him and they heard about the Lord Jesus and how he had died on a cross and suffered hell in place of anyone who would repent and believe on him. And soon there was a new topic of conversation in the mess. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But they would ask each other, have you, have you guarded that Paul? Yeah, did he talk to you about Jesus as well? <laughs> what do you think about that? What do you think? Some of them believed. And none of them could deny that Paul was there to do God's work. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, nobody would have expected a revival among the emperor's guards. They were last on the list of potential likely converts. But God used Paul's chains for a mighty work of grace. Now, isn't that a great encouragement to you? Isn't that a thrill to you, Christian? We all have chains. All of us have ties that we feel stop us from being effect as effective as we could be for the Lord Jesus. You're chained to a job or to a farm when you'd rather be doing missionary or preaching or ministry work. You're chained to a home with children or a relative who needs constant care and attention. You're chained to a room and you feel like you can never even get out of that one room. There are physical limitations that keep you at home. God has put you there and he will use you there. And so you must pray, God, make me usable. That's the first prayer that we pray. Not God, use me, but God, make me usable. And then we use those opportunities when they come and speak a word for the Lord Jesus. The third group that I want you to see benefit from Paul's situation are Roman Christians. Christians in the city of Rome. Verse 14. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. You see, the Christians in Rome saw the impact of Paul's prison ministry. These palace guardsmen who were so tough, so unreachable, started coming to church. And they wanted to hear more about the Lord Jesus. It was a great encouragement to them. These unreachable men were being saved and wanting to grow in grace. But it was also a rebuke. It was also a rebuke to them. Because they could see if this was being achieved by one man who couldn't even decide who he spoke to or where he went, well then what, what am I doing with my freedom? So the, Christian in, the Christians in Rome start to think less about themselves. And they put aside embarrassment. And they put aside fear. And they start to speak for the Lord Jesus. Jesus. 
Today we see the church growing in places where it's persecuted most. And it's an encouragement to us to see God pouring out his grace in those places, to see the church growing. We're encouraged, but we're much slower to take the rebuke. Why are we not making more of the freedom that we have? You know, Brent shared a little quote with me recently from a book that some of you are reading called The Insanity of God. And the quote went something like this. this is a real paraphrase, but he said something like this. This missionary person who was involved in working in a, an incredibly hard area said, do not give up in freedom what we refuse to give up in persecution. In verse 16, Paul says that this freshly enthusiastic group of Roman Christians are preaching fearlessly out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. You see, they see Paul doing what they should be doing. They see him living as he should be living, as we all should be following the Lord Jesus. It rebuked their laziness. And it made them want to join him in speaking for and suffering with the Lord Jesus. Now, it is crucial that you and I are supporting the persecuted church. And it's so important that we're supporting it practically and prayerfully. But the best way that we can be supporting Christians around the globe is by joining them in preaching and living for the Lord Jesus where we are. The fourth group that, are, that benefit from Paul's situation are Roman sinners. Not just Roman Christians, but those who are outside of the church as well. Verse 15 and then verse 17 and 18. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does that matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. You see, the Roman church leaders were motivated to preach the gospel as well, but for a very different reason. You see, they were jealous of the Apostle Paul and saw this as an opportunity to take advantage his imprisonment was a chance for them to draw people to themselves and put Paul down. They are not sincere, verse 17. They want to cause trouble for Paul. It breaks our heart to read this happening in the early church, doesn't it? But look at Paul's reaction, verse 18. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached he doesn't agree with the method he doesn't agree with the motive but he loves that Christ is being preached sometimes you just step back and marvel at this man who's who's writing marvel at the grace of God being poured into his life he doesn't care he doesn't He's not even slightly bothered that he's belittled, that he's made fun of, that he's reduced to nothing as long as Christ is made great. The Roman preachers might not be truly following the Lord Jesus, but Roman people are hearing the gospel. Now this is a big help for us as a church when we think about unity and working together. So when we ask who should be members of our church, should they be infant Baptists? Should they be Calvinists? Should they be amillennialists? No. There's one qualification. Do you love and belong to the Lord Jesus? Do you call him Lord and do you prove by fruit in your life that you are his? It helps us when we think about what churches we can be working with as a church. We don't demand that you be Presbyterian. But we do demand that you preach Christ crucified. 
It's got to be there. And not the Jesus of Mormonism or modernism or humanism, but the Jesus of the Bible. If this Jesus... If the Jesus of all 66 books that we see on every page, if this Christ is preached at your church, if he is magnified amongst your people, then we can at least, at the very least, pray with a clear conscience that God would bless that ministry by glorifying his Son amongst you. It's incredibly sad when we get sidetracked and love our denomination or our theology more than Christ. We think that if things are not done our way, well, then they're not worth bothering with at all. Now, doctrinal purity is vital. We need to have a way of doing things, and we should love that way of doing things because it comes from Scripture. But where people disagree with us, and still preach Christ. Well, then there is cause for us to rejoice. The fifth group or person this time, and the last beneficiary of Paul's situation is Paul himself. Verse 18. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this... I rejoice. Look how he follows his own train of logic as he writes to the Philippians. Philippi is encouraged, verse 12. The palace guard is revived, verse 13. Roman Christians are preaching, verse 14. Roman sinners are hearing the gospel, verse 15 to 18. Yes, they're hearing it from men who are faulty in motive, but they're still men who are faithful in message. And so when Paul looks at this whole situation, when he steps back and sees what God is doing, even in the dark cold of his cell, he can't help but rejoice. Because in every way... Christ is preached. And because of this, says Paul, I rejoice. Christian, there is rejoicing for you to do this evening. You are to rejoice or you are to be amazed by two things this evening. Number one, the captivating worthiness of the Lord Jesus. That he is so worthy and so beautiful that a brilliant-minded, potential-filled man like Paul can sit in a dungeon and rejoice. Because even though it looks like he is being utterly wasted, God is using him to the glory of the Lord Jesus. And that means more to Paul than anything else in the world. Do you know Christ like that? Is this the Jesus that you love? You must ask the Holy Spirit to reveal him to you, to show you more of who he really is. How will you rejoice? How will you face, let alone rejoice, in suffering? Until you know that Christ is worth suffering for. The second thing that you must be amazed at, you must rejoice in, is the sovereign goodness of the Lord Jesus. That he doesn't just bring something good out of a bad situation. He's not a magician who just pulls a rabbit out of the hat. He just pulls one good thing out and surprises us with it, but he turns the whole situation for the good of his people. You see how he did that with Paul here? Every aspect of what was happening, he turned to his glory. He didn't sacrifice Paul for the good of the church. We can think that way sometimes, can't we? That God puts him there because the church needs to grow. But it wasn't just sacrificing Paul for the good of the church. It was best for Paul too. God did this for Paul's best too. You see, because Paul was there, he was able to rejoice in chains for Christ that he wouldn't have had otherwise. 
he wouldn't have been able to rejoice the way he does. He wouldn't have this joy that his Savior is being preached. You think about Simon. What good comes out of that situation? What good can come from this? Well, we don't know fully yet. But we've already seen some things. There were two editions of the Southland Times that had more gospel in them than they've ever had. And we've had opportunities to speak to people that we've never had before. Could this be one of the ways, the way that God will use to open some people's hearts and bring them to salvation? Think about Jane. What good has come from Jane's death? We miss our sister. But in these last weeks, she has given us something invaluable. She's given us something you can't buy, something you couldn't get any other way. We have been blessed as a church by the testimony of a woman who has held on to the Lord Jesus in the toughest possible time. And we've been challenged by her confidence of heaven, even in the face of death. We've been rebuked in our old coldness towards the Lord Jesus by her husband and her sisters and her children who are hurting but still trusting in God. We've been confronted with real faith that makes us ask, would I be able to stand that strong if it was me? Faith that makes us long for a closer walk with God. And there is more good to come. On Saturday there will be a funeral service and if God wills it, many, many people will hear his gospel preached. Did God sacrifice Jane for the good of our church? No. It was best for Jane too. She wouldn't have it any other way now, would she? She's home. She's with her Lord Jesus. She's with her Savior. And she's rejoicing too. Let's pray. Father, we marvel at the beauty and the worthiness of the Lord Jesus. But we confess we know so little of it. Just the glimmer that we've seen of Christ's majesty has been enough to keep us following him. The grace that you've given us has been enough to keep us fleeing sin and running after you. Oh, give us more though, we pray. Open our eyes by your Holy Spirit's power to see more of how worthy and wonderful the Lord Jesus is that when these difficulties come, when these challenges come, we would have something worth suffering, worth enduring for. More of Jesus. Give us more, we pray. And Father, help us to marvel at his great sovereign goodness to us that he works entire situations that we see as, as blackest pits with no hope in sight, yet he turns all of it for your great glory and for our greatest good. Help us to cling to these truths, we pray. Draw us closer to yourself, more love for Christ more love for his people, more love for the lost. Give us, we pray, for your great glory. In Jesus' name, amen.